Welcome. We're now going to begin the genetic disease unit. In this unit, we're going to ask, how is genetics related to disease? We're also going to look at how technology is used to treat and diagnose disease. And as we're doing this, we're going to keep in mind that ideas about genetics are always growing and changing. And so we need to figure out how can we stay on top of this? How can we find out about recent updates of science understanding of genetic diseases? Today we're just going to cover some of the basics. What are genetic disorder disorders? Well, that's any disease that is caused by messed up DNA. But that messed up DNA can come from a single gene disorder, from a chromosome abnormality, or from a multifactorial disorder. Now a single gene disorder is anytime you have a mutation in just one gene, or if that entire gene is missing. An example of this is Huntington's disease. In Huntington's disease, the HTT gene has a lot of extra CAGs in it, which means the Huntington protein is a lot longer, and that negatively affects the neurons, so it causes progressive brain disease and eventually death later in life. Chromosomal abnormalities are whenever you have an extra chromosome or you're missing a chromosome, you, you're missing a chunk of chromosome or you have an extra chunk of chromosome. Um, so this deals at the larger chromosomal level. An example of this is Down syndrome where there's an extra chromosome 21 and this leads to traits like a smaller stature and an upward slant of the eyes. Multifactorial disorders are ones where there's more than one gene involved and a lot of times there's an environmental cause too. So we've already spent a lot of time talking about this with cancer where we know it takes more than one mutation for cancer to occur and a lot of times um, it's not just mutations you're born with, it's also mutations caused by environmental factors. So as we start today, we're going to talk about single gene disorders. And before we get into that, I really want you to pause and think to yourself, what is a mutation and what are some ways that an individual can get a mutation? So pause the screen and return to me when you're done. Okay. So genetic mutations are mutations, um, are changes in the DNA sequence. Now this altered gene that happens because the mutation can be, will be passed on every single time that cell divides and becomes another cell. And we see these mutations happening in sex cells and in body cells. What I want you to think about now is will the mutations in body cells be passed on to an organism's offspring? What about sex cells? Answer this question, pause me, and return when you're, when you're done answering it. All right. Well, when you think about this, let's pretend, for example, that I um, have spent too much time out in the sun. And because of that excess time in the sun, I have impacted my skin cells. Skin cells are body cells. My question is, will all that extra tanning and that potentially uh, mutated cells in my skin be passed on to my daughters? Well, the key is, is understanding what offspring are made up of. They are made up of sex cells. So how would my skin cell then somehow get to my offspring? When you think about body cells, um, those are not going to be impacted. However, if the mutation is in a sex cell, like a sperm and egg, and that sperm or egg gets fertilized and becomes an offspring, then the mutation will be passed on. But in body cells, they're not going to be passed on. These mutations might cause individual issues for me. I might have problems from in my own skin cells, but my daughters should not. Now, the next question is, are mutations harmful? For a moment, I don't want you to take notes. I just want you to look at the screen. So we know our classic central dogma of genetics is DNA, RNA, protein, trait. So the question is, is if the DNA changes, and therefore the RNA changes, will the protein and the trait change? So sometimes it depends. Sometimes we have silent mutations. So maybe we might have a mutation where we should have a CGU, but instead we have a CGC.
But in that case, both of those codons make up arginine. And arginine is the protein or the amino acid. So since that does not change, in this case, the DNA uh, it is not a mutation that impacts the offspring. Sometimes the change in the protein is small enough where it doesn't e exactly affect the trait. So if the amino acid is changed, but it happens to be on the outside of a protein for a certain enzyme and it doesn't affect the way that protein is folded, it might not impact the trait at all. So here you can see the DNA and the RNA and the protein change, but the trait does not change. Sometimes the protein changes enough that it actually impacts the trait. Now, we have a different trait, but the question is, is that trait going to be helpful, harmful, or neutral? And that might depend on the environment. So that's, we get back to our question, are all mutations harmful? We're well, first of all, hopefully now you recognize that not all mutations end up with a change in trait. But assuming it does end up in a change in trait, w some genetic mutations actually could help an organism. For example, did you know that there is a mutation that leads to immunity to HIV? The people who have this mutant allele don't express a certain protein on the outside of their T-cells, and as a result, they're resistant to HIV infection and AIDS. That's a hugely helpful mutation especially in an environment where there's a lot of HIV. Some mutations are harmful. PK, on PKU, there is this defective gene on chromosome 12, and if children have two copies of that, they don't have the ability to break down the amino acid phenylalanine. Now, if this is not caught, and um, they, if the individual continues to eat phenylalanine, PKU can lead to mental retardation by the end of the first year of life. So that's definitely a harmful mutation. Now there's some mutations that have no effect. An example of this is the American curl. So we have these small changes in a phenotype like curled ears on this kitty cat. But this is not impacting whether or not this kitty cat can mate, have offspring, and so as a result we would say this mutation has no effect. Sometimes it depends on the environment. So lactose intolerance it could be considered a helpful trait because it makes it easy to wean the young. But um, it also could be considered a bad trait if, if milk is one of their main food products. So it would depend on the environment. Um, in, a, in a society where there isn't a lot of milk, it's great because they can wean their young off quickly, which means um, usually women who are nursing have a harder time getting pregnant again. So in an idea where you want the population to grow, and if you want an individual to pass on their traits, have, being able to have more offspring could be considered a benefit. However, however, in an environment where milk is used as a food product, cow's milk for example, then being lactose tolerant is the helpful trait because in those spaces it might help those individuals be more likely to get some food, more likely to survive, reproduce, pass on that trait. Another example of this is sickle cell resistance. So in um, to have two copies of sickle cell anemia is bad because the person will ha get sickle cell anemia, they'll have a sickling effect potentially, they are in huge amounts of pain, and I think we've seen videos about this. But if you have just one copy, sickle cell anemia with uh, sickle cell resistance will make you resistant to malaria, just one copy. So in this country where we don't have a lot of malaria, having a single copy of the sickle cell allele is not that helpful. But in Africa, in Zimbabwe for example, where there's a lot of malaria, having just one copy is a huge advantage. So again, here's an example where whether or not you have a trait, whether or not a trait is helpful depends on the environment. Now, one of the things that we do, one of the technologies we do to diagnose diseases is genetic testing. Now, we have a lot of genetic tests for single gene disorders. In certain conditions, such as PKU, 
having this genetic test, if we can identify it soon enough, we can modify these kids' diets so that they don't even ever show any symptoms. They just stop eating phenylalanine. And this is part of the newborn screening here in Michigan. There are a lot of causes of mutations. There are spontaneous mutations that happen kind of like problems in your copy machine where you have like a weird spot that show up on the piece of paper, just a mistake in base pairing. We also have mutagens. These are environmental factors, things like the UV light that I talked about earlier that can um, mess with my DNA. Specifically, when I was there tanning younger, it was breaking apart my DNA and it could result in deletions in it. There's also chemical mutagens like asbestos and formaldehyde, and those usually cause substitution mutations. Now, the two key types of mutations are point mutations, and um, because they have a point mutation, they simply maybe change the letter. So if we, instead of using uh, the A, a, T, G, C letters, if instead we used normal letters like words and said the dog bit the cat, changing a single letter might be the dog bit the car. Sometimes changing one letter like this drastically changes the meaning of a sentence. And like that, sometimes just one letter change could drastically change a person's phenotype. For example, Tay-Sachs disease. In Tay-Sachs disease, that's just a single letter change and that results in death, usually by the time the individual is age two, just one letter change. Another type of mutation is an addition or a deletion that would cause a frame shift. So for example, instead of the dog bit the cat, if we removed the letter G, it would become the dog it heck at. So take a second and think about which type of mutation is likely to be most disruptive. Discuss that with your partner. So in general, we expect that frame shift mutations are more disruptive than point mutations because they're going to affect every codon following the mutations. And point mutations are probably only going to affect one codon. That being said, like I said with Tay-Sachs disease, sometimes just a single base change can profoundly impact the organism. At this time, I'd like you to look at genetic changes case one, look at those two different sequences and try to answer the questions based on the information we've learned today.